Hi everyone. Uh, so this is the first in a series of videos that I decided I would do for uh, specifically Chemistry 12 students uh, in British Columbia. Um, obviously, probably work for anywhere, but this is specifically for the BC curriculum. Um, I'm a teacher in North Vancouver, and so I know the curriculum really well. I've been teaching for a million years, and uh, specifically Chem 12. So what I decided to do is uh, run a series of lectures. I mean, it's just me my whiteboard um, going through the the different topics that I know that you would be going through uh, for the remainder of the year starting with um, the chemistry unit which many of you are probably already a long way into already um, but I'm going to go back to the beginning and start at the beginning of acids and bases um, I will go through hydrolysis and titration uh, and then I'll do the reduction oxidation unit at the end as well so there will be a whole bunch of series of of lectures that I would probably normally do in my own classes uh, that can help you out uh, for the remainder of the year depending on when we go back to school if we go back to school um, kind of keep you up to date uh, hopefully your own teachers are probably doing something for you as well um, in terms of assignments and assessments and all that kind of thing but if if we happen to not go back at all, um, then this might be useful for those of you going on to university next year. Um, you don't want to miss the entire acid base unit and the redox unit going into a first year chemistry class. Um, so this is a whole series. Um, I'm going to do little bits and pieces. I'm going to follow along the way I would teach uh, Chem 12. Um, and so, uh, yeah, just check in once in a while. Um, just follow this. YouTube channel and, and uh, you'll see all the different lectures. I'll hopefully in the title it'll tell you what the topic is going to be. So I'm going to start with the acid base unit and the acid base unit uh, es essentially starts with um, definitions and then we're going to go from there. Okay so I put on the board here you can kind of see the the four things that I want to study or go through today. Uh, these are all qualitative things there's not going to be any numbers today it's all going to be definition and maybe some chemical e equations and formulas and things of that nature. No math. Um, the acid-base unit gets very mathematical, um, but we'll deal with that when we come to it. Okay, so I put down uh, four different things here. Um, reviewing what you previously knew, um, so coming out of grade 10, grade 11, um, there's the typical way that science teachers and, and chem 11 teachers rightly so, teach you about acids and bases. They're quite a bit more complicated than what you've been told previously. Um, and so we don't jump right into it on an early, at an early stage because uh, understanding how it works might be a little bit too much for your average Science 10 and even for your average Chem 11 student. Um, um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to go into the, the, I call it a modern definition. It's not modern. I mean, it's first proposed in 1923 so how modern is that but it's the it's the version of the acid and base um, definitions that we use in everyday chemistry uh, life and and you'll see that if you progress further in in university science you'll see that there's there's more detailed definitions as well but we'll we'll go with the basic one that we're going to use here in in chem 12. Um, we'll then kind of connect the two. So you'll see how were we correct with our previous understanding and, and how has it evolved a little bit with the, with the new understanding. And then I want to end the, the lecture with um, a little bit about water, which if you can understand what water is doing, then it's a good place to jump into uh, how do you understand pH and something called POH and why is it neutral and why is a pH of three ten times stronger than a pH of four. So things of that nature. So we'll get into that um, later on. We'll give you at least the qualitative side of things today. So let's start with what you previously knew. So coming out of grade 10, grade 11, you were probably told that um, acids, when they're in water, they produce H+. So you might have seen something like an acid, like something as simple as hydrochloric acid, which is HCl. So you would have seen that, and the definition of an acid would say, well, okay, well, if it produces H+, plus, then it must have H+, plus in its formula. And typically when it's an H+, plus, it would be on the left side of the formula, kind of like an ionic compound would have the H. So 
HCl in the old definition. If you put it into water, what it typically, what you were typically taught is that it would produce H plus ions, and perhaps you would even have learned, hopefully you did in Chem 11 anyways, that those were aqueous, meaning they're dissolved in water, floating around in water as individuals. And chloride ions, so Cl minus ions, also aqueous, floating around in the water. So that's what you were taught back in the good old days about, about acids, that you throw them into water and they dissociate to produce H plus ions and, C, and whatever the anion was. In this case, it was Cl. So that is an, an older definition. That's called an Arrhenius definition of an acid. And an Arrhenius definition, Arrhenius was a uh, chemist, uh, but it's 19th century chemistry. So Arrhenius defined an acid as producing H plus ions back in 1884. So we're talking a long time ago. Um, and so that's kind of where most of you were when it came to acids. For bases, um, the base, the critical element of the base, or not element, the critical part of the base, was the fact that it produced hydroxide. So you typically would have a base that had a hydroxide, which is OH minus, as the anion. So, a common one, sodium hydroxide. Most of us have probably come across sodium hydroxide or any hydroxide compound. Um, and if you have hydroxide as an, in an ionic compound, when it is put into water, it dissociates into its ions. So, it dissociates into Na+. And OH minus, and it was the OH minus that made the base the base, like the basic solution, is because hydroxide was floating around in there. So essentially, what we ended up having is you end up having acids produce this, the hydrogen ion, and bases produce hydroxide. That. So the idea was that acids and bases dissociate in water to produce those two ions. And so any acid would have to have an H plus and would therefore have to dissociate once you dissolve it into water and the H plus would float around and make it acidic. And if you had a base, it was a, any compound that in water would dissociate to produce hydroxide. So I guess by definition, the fact that I'm using the word dissociate, Anytime you're talking about dissociating, you'd be talking about an ionic compound. And an ionic compound dissociates when you put it into water, it means falls apart into its ions. So there's a bit of a problem with that because the hydroxide, the bases, that's fine. Hydroxide is an anion. It is typically found in ionic compounds. Not typically, it is found in ionic compounds because it's an ion. But something like HCl and H, plus, there's, a, there's two issues with it. Number one, hydrogen doesn't bind as, or it doesn't bond, sorry, uh, with other atoms as an ion. It actually bonds covalently to other atoms. So there are, um, I mean, something as simple as hydrochloric acid, HCl. Hydrogen and chlorine don't actually bond like this. Okay, so this is, this definition right here where I've written HCl dissociating would assume that the H plus is a little ion. It's lost its electron. It's now positively charged. It's an entity unto itself. It's stable and all that kind of stuff. And chloride is also an, an ion. It has gained an electron and it has a stable outer shell. You know, all that stuff that you've learned in grade 10 and grade 11. However, that's not actually the case. The hydrogen has not actually donated its electron over to the chlorine. When hydrogen bumps in to a chlorine, like out in the world, <clears throat> what it actually does is it forms a covalent bond with the chlorine. So the hydrogen has, I'll put it right here, one electron. When you think back to your Lewis understanding, there's one electron and here's a chlorine. the Lewis. And so when they come into contact with each other, that electron right there does not get transferred to the chlorine to form an H plus and a Cl minus. 
they actually overlap and share. So what you truly have when they bind is you have that. And so those two electrons, these two right here, are actually a covalent pair of electrons. They're being shared amongst those two. They're not being evenly shared because the chlorine has a higher electronegativity. So the chlorine is actually partially negative and the hydrogen partially positive. Not fully positive, partially positive. So when we draw, when I draw this, that assumes it's an ionic compound. It is not. It's a covalent compound. So covalent compounds don't dissociate in water. They form molecular solutions. So when you take HCl and you dump HCl molecules, which are covalently bonded into water, they don't dissociate into ions. They stay together as an HCl molecule floating around as a molecule. Now it's a polar molecule, so it dissolves really well. But that hydrogen doesn't fall off and float around by itself. That's problem number one. Problem number two is that protons don't exist in on their own. Okay, so you might say a proton. Why is he talking about a proton? Well, an H plus is essentially a proton. If you take a hydrogen atom, hydrogen atom has a single proton in the middle, an electron zipping around the outside of it. So if you were to make, that's a neutral H. If you were to make an H plus, that means you would have to remove that electron so it's not there anymore. So an H plus is essentially a proton, and you'll see that actually in, in different scientific te texts all the time. You'll see instead of using the word proton, they'll just say H plus. So H plus means a proton. Proton means an H plus. And so protons don't exist just kind of floating around in water on their own. Um, and so that's problem number two. So these definitions... For the acid, anyways, the acid is a little bit of an issue because acids are typically an H bonded to another atom, and they're typically bonded in a covalent manner, which means they don't dissociate in the first place. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, to dissociate, you have to be dissociating to form a proton, kind of free-floating proton floating around in the water, which doesn't typically happen either. So that problem, that's the problem with the acids. The problem with the bases, and this one... I mean, you know this from at home. So bases, you've been told, they produce hydroxide in water. Um, but you've also been told that you go into your, your cupboard at home and chemicals like um, ammonia, so Windex and glass cleaner. Ammonia is NH3. So ammonia is that chemical. So if you go and get your, your glass cleaner, you actually have, it's, I don't know what the actual percentage is, but it's ammonia dissolved in water. So that's what it is. So, but it's a basic solution. Like you can test it. You probably did in like grade nine or 10 or whenever you're, you're testing different mixtures. You put a little piece of pH paper into a, into glass cleaner and it comes out really quite basic. Well, that means it has to be producing hydroxide according to your definition of what a base would be. I don't see any hydroxide in NH3. One, it's covalent because it's nitrogen and it's hydrogen all bonded together. Those are covalent bonds. We're not even talking about an ionic compound. And there's no hydroxide in sight. And yet the thing produces hydroxide. So how is that even possible? The other one that, you know, is very typical is uh, something like Tums. You go munch on a Tums because you've got too much stomach acid or something like that. Well, stomach acid, okay, that's great. You eat the Tums. Well, you eat the Tums because it neutralizes your stomach acid, which must mean it's a base, right? Well, the number one component in Tums is calcium carbonate. So calcium carbonate is an ionic compound. When an ionic, okay, so there, it's an ionic compound. That kind of fits with the base has to be an ionic compound, so it dissociates. But calcium carbonate, when it dissociates, produces calcium ions floating around and carbonate ions floating around. Again, there's not a speck of hydroxide anywhere in sight when you dissolve calcium carbonate into water or you eat it and it goes into your stomach. 
no hydroxide in either of those. So how can they be basic if there's no hydroxide? Like that doesn't make sense. Okay, so that's kind of where maybe you're at right at this moment, where you knew that, and maybe you also knew about the pH scale and seven is neutral and below seven is acidic and above seven is, is basic or alkaline. You probably knew all of that stuff. The pH scale, that's a quantitative thing. We'll get to that later. But you probably knew kind of the basic definition of an acid has an H plus and a base has hydroxide. But there's some issues with those definitions, which we allowed those... <laughs> So we allowed those definitions because they were the simplified version of things. So starting in grade 10 and grade 11, when you're learning about these acids and bases, it made a little bit more sense. Neutralizations made sense because an H plus and an OH minus, they would form water. Um, it kind of simplified the issue. When you neutralize NH3 with an acid, what do you get? You don't get water. Oh, okay, that's weird. Um, so all of these things are complicated and yet they have to be complicated. So we left it at the Chem 11 definition as being maybe a little bit false, or maybe we didn't tell you the whole truth. Um, probably could have told you a little bit more truth, but like I said, it's pretty complicated. So we didn't really want to get into it when you didn't quite have the chemistry yet. So let's go into the updated chemistry. Okay, so the updated chemistry has to do with what's called the Bronsted-Lowry definition of acids and bases. And the Bronsted-Lowry definition is, a, what it comes down to is this. Acids and bases, the things that you previously knew, they are still acids and bases. They still follow the proper definition. So don't think that, oh God, everything I learned previously doesn't work anymore. No, it still works. It's still part of it. It's just that you learned a very small kind of, portion of acids and bases and it's the portion is it's actually part of a larger world of acids and bases so the moving from the Arrhenius definition where things just dissociated to make H plus and OH minus you're moving from this small kind of simplistic world to a much more complex world of acids and bases the Bronsted Lowry world that allows you to understand the acid or acidic and basic properties of different chemicals so the Bronsted Lowry definition I'm going to write them down um, just so you have them kind of sitting in front of you. So the Bronsted Lowry, I'll call it BL. The BL acid is a chemical that donates an H plus slash proton. So any acid, if you're going to be an acid, you have to take an H and give it to another chemical. You actually have to like stick it onto another chemical. Now, because you have to stick it onto another chemical, I guess you better have one in the very first place, right? So um, the typical acid chemicals that you've seen, HCl, HNO3, H2SO4, uh, CH3, COOH, all those acids that you've learned about previously and you kind of memorize, well, the formula of an acid has to have an H typically on the left, or if it's one of those Ku acids, those are organic acids, the H is at the end. It has to have an H, so it has to have a donatable H. Well, that's still true. The Bronsted-Lowry definition says that that H has to be there. So when you memorize that uh, H3PO4 is an acid. Well, it's still an acid, regardless of whether you understand the acid working as an Arrhenius acid or a Bronsted-Lowry acid. They still have an H. It's just that it doesn't dissociate to produce the H+. It actually gives it to another chemical, meaning it fits a little bit more of your Chem 12 definition, where you've learned about reaction kinetics and you've learned that two uh, chemicals have to collide. And if they collide, something happens when they collide. Well, in an acid-base chemical reaction, when the collision occurs between an acid and another molecule, what happens is the H gets moved from the acid over to the other molecule. So acids 
are the donators of that H. So in that collision between an acid and another chemical, the acid donates the H to another chemical. The Bronsted Lowry base. chemical that, and you can probably already guess what it is based on what the previous one was, whoops, that accepts a proton or an H plus. So the two key words here are, are donate and accept. So bases accept. So if you're talking about an acid-base reaction, Chem 12, where collision theory would have to would say that they have to collide, they have to collide with sufficient energy, and they have to collide with the proper geometry, for an acid-base reaction to occur, the acid has to collide with the base in such a way that the H can get donated from the original molecule, the acid, to the base. And so it has to hit the right way, and it has to hit with enough energy so the H can actually be moved from one chemical over to the other. When that occurs, the one donating is called the acid, when the one accepting is called the base. And it's like it's that simple. That's all it is. So the definitions of acids and bases don't really have to do with dissociate to produce H plus and dissociate to produce OH minus. Those things are resulting from chemical reactions involving acids and bases, as you're going to see later on as we get a little bit more complicated. But the basic gist of it is one chemical bumps into another and H plus gets donated from one to the other. And so that's where the basic definition comes from. Okay, so if, if you're talking about that type of chemical reaction, between an acid and a base, and an H plus goes from one to the other. And, okay, so is it not true that H pluses and OH minuses kind of make acidic and basic solutions? Is that was that all a lie? And that's not that was not a lie. So those solutions still form. Well, I should well back up a little bit. Um, acids producing H plus is kind of a lie. Um, we'll get to that right now. So. What exactly are acids and bases doing? So your previous knowledge from Science 10 and Chem 11 is acids produce H plus when dissolved in water through dissociation and bases um, in water dissociate to produce hydroxide. So acids and bases still do kind of the same thing. They change the composition of a solution, but how they do it is kind of an interesting way. Okay, so how does an acid make the H plus? Well, first thing I got to get out, out is they don't make H plus. <laughs> they produce something called hydronium. And hydronium is um, a chemical that will float around in water. It's an ion. It floats around in water just as you would think an H plus was floating around in water. And hydronium and H plus are kind of equivalent things, theoretically. Although hydronium is the real thing, and H plus is kind of a fictitious thing. So what is this hydronium thing? So let me show you in a chemical equation. So HCl, we used HCl before, so hydrochloric acid. So the formula of hydrochloric acid is HCl. When I first throw this thing into water, okay, the very first thing that happens, whatever form you throw HCl into a water, whether you bubble it through because it's gaseous or you happen to have crystals of it or something like that, and you throw it into water, the very first thing, ha that, thing that happens, because it's a covalent compound, it forms a molecular solution. So HCl molecules don't fall apart. They stay together. So if this is the H and this is the Cl, they're still covalently bonded and they go around together. In an ionic solution, you throw them in the water, they would have fallen apart. But they stay bonded together. Because of that, you keep the whole formula of the chemical. So HCl and you write Aq, meaning it's the whole molecule is dissolved in water. It needs a kind of a buddy reactant. So the HCl is thrown into water. Well, if it's pure water and the HCl has nothing, it's got other HCl, I guess it could bump into, but it's primarily going to bump into water molecules, like they're floating around. There's lots of them floating around. So a couple of HCls floating around and a gabillion water molecules floating around. So they 
bump into water molecules. Well, the water molecules are in liquid form, right? And you have a beaker full of water. So they're in liquid form. And they're going to chemically react. It means they bump into each other. Collision theory, they collide, they collide with sufficient energy and, and correct geometry. So what do they form? Okay, so I'm going to draw a picture of this. So here's HCl. So here's the H. Down to the chlorine. The chlorine's bigger than the H because H is a little guy. So there's the HCl. It's going to bump into a water molecule. Okay, and I'm going to draw it so that the geometry is correct. So I'm going to draw it. So here's the oxygen. Here's one little H. Here's another little H. And there's our typical water molecule H2O. So if the two of them bump into each other, Okay, so kind of imagine this guy right here and this guy right here, they're moving towards each other and they, they smash into each other. This H right here, okay, this is, okay, we're getting a little chem 11 here with the polarity of things. So this little guy right here is partially positive and that chlorine is partially negative. It's a polar molecule, so chlorine has the higher electronegativity, it draws the electrons towards it and yada yada yada. Partially positive, partially negative. The water molecule is kind of the same thing where oxygen's partially negative one, higher electronegativity, and H is partially positive. And so when they come towards each other, well, guess what? The partially positive hydrogen of HCl really likes the partially negative of oxygen of the water molecule. And so they're attracted to each other, they bump into each other. And not only that, but I want to point out an extra little thing here. This water molecule has a couple of pair of, of electrons. There are two lone pairs of electrons kind of sitting there, almost like a dock. If you had something that was missing two electrons, it could dock on top of it. So this hydrogen right here, its electron is in that covalent bond. And so what happens is this. This hydrogen right here decides, well, I'm going to go over here. And I'm going to sit on those two electrons right there. And I want you to imagine in your own mind what would happen. Well, the two electrons that are part of this bond right here stay with the chlorine. The hydrogen doesn't really want the electrons in the first place, so it stays over here. So this chlorine gets the two electrons that were part of that bond. So if you can kind of imagine, it now has its eight little electrons sitting there. The hydrogen leaves, it has no electrons. It's a proton, remember? So the proton, but it's not floating around in water. It's actually being transferred from the HCl over to the water molecule. And it sits on top of here. So it's coming over with no electrons. So those two electrons right there on the water molecule, Perfect, they can act as bonding electrons. And so what ends up happening is you end up having the Cl down here, but because it's got that extra electron now, the hydrogen left behind, it's now Cl minus. Just kind of sitting there, you know, it's, it is super happy actually that the hydrogen left. I mean, Cl minus is actually a very stable ion. This thing right here, what is that thing for? Well, now it's an O, right? It's that oxygen right there with a hydrogen off of there, hydrogen off of there, but now it's got another hydrogen off of here. Now, not only that, but that hydrogen was, it's a plus one, it's a proton, so it's plus one. We've taken this neutral water molecule added a hydrogen to it, which is like a proton, not like a proton, it is a proton, so it's plus one. This thing now has one extra positive charge on it. So this thing is positively charged, which is kind of weird. So, but this is the actual chemical reaction that happens when an acid and, and comes in contact with water. Well, what have we pre created? Well, we've created this weird thing, which, is H3O, it's got three hydrogens and one oxygen, and a positive charge, plus one. 
And then left behind also is this chloride. So Cl minus. So the two of them together, they, they balance their charges, right? So over here on this side, you've got neutral and neutral. The reactants are neutral. Positive one, negative one. The products come out to a combined neutral as well. So there's a conservation of charge there. And so what you've got, these are the actual chemicals that you've produced, an ion of chloride and an ion that is H3O+. This thing is called hydronium. And so the actual result of an acid donating an H plus to a water molecule is hydronium. And when you take an acid and dissolve it into water, it does not dissociate into H plus and an anion. It forms hydronium. And so the hydronium, which is this thing, that's the guy that makes the solution acidic. And so once we start talking about acids, they are chemicals that when dissolved in water, they produce hydronium, not H+. And so you'll start talking about the hydronium all the time. Okay, and you'll, what will happen is oftentimes you'll have uh, chem teachers, um, anybody really talking chemistry, they'll kind of interchange hydronium and H+, right? Like it's a, they're, H plus has been used for so long and it's so ingrained in people to talk about acids and H plus that it's typically always used. You'll see it in textbooks, you'll see it in formulas, you'll see it in like in equations um, where you're calculating different things. You'll see it in biology, you'll see it in physics. Um, you'll see it all the time. But when you're talking from a chemical perspective, when you take an acid and throw it into water, it produces hydronium, H3O plus. So that's what you've got. So all acids do this. If I take H3PO4, which is phosphoric acid, throw it into water, the first thing it does is forms a molecular solution. So it's AQ plus water in the liquid form. Chemically reacts. One of the H's from the H3PO4, one of the H's from the H3PO4 gets donated to the water molecule. To make, now look at this thing right here, H2O, add a another H to it, it makes H3O plus. This guy becomes that. The H2O accepts the H plus. And this guy loses an H because it got transferred over to water. So it loses an H. Well, it's down to H2 because it's had three before, you lose one, it's okay, it's pretty simple math, it goes down to two. PO4 negative one. It was neutral over here on this side, it was a neutral charge thing, right? I didn't write any charge up there, so it's neutral. You lose an H plus, it goes down in charge from zero down to negative one. Again, the reactants, add them together, they're neutral. Neutral and neutral makes neutral. The products, add them together, plus one, negative one, it forms neutral as well. And so there should be balancing of charge, conservation of charge. And so that guy, the water picks up the H, this guy loses. So picks up, that guy loses. Now you can see that they're, they're partners with each other, right? So you can kind of see that, hey, this guy donated an H. That guy is the acid, right? If you're looking at this thing left or right, the H3PO4 is the chemical that lost the H. It donated the H over to the water. Oddly enough, the water picked up the H. It acted as the base. So the water acted as the base. Weird, because water is not a base in this chemical reaction. And it's kind of, this is, you're going to have to get your mind around this. That acids and bases are defined by what their activity is during a chemical reaction. And so acids donate H's, bases pick up H's. And so it's, it's that simple. In a collision, who gets the H? Who lost the H? 
The losing of the H is the acid, the gaining of the H is the base. And so acid and water in this case is a base. When water acts as a base, it forms hydronium. When H3OPO4 acts as an acid, it forms H2PO4 negative 1. Now, well, this is okay, this is kind of weird. You're looking at this, I'm hoping you're looking at this and saying to yourself, Okay, so they're just one H different from each other. What if this reaction could go back the other direction? What if you went right to left? You know, Chem 12 is all about equilibrium, right? So you've learned that reactions don't just go in the forward direction. They can go backwards, too. So what if we go in the backwards direction? What if we go right to left? We go from here back the other way. Do you notice that the H3O plus going back to H2O, all it is is losing an H. This thing, going back the other way, is gaining the H, so it's doing the opposite. So in left to right, when H3PO4 was the acid, its partner over here, going in the opposite direction, is actually a base. And that language is actually critical. So this is known as the conjugate base of H3PO4 because it can pick up an H and go back to H3PO4. H3O plus is the conjugate, and you probably guessed it before I even started writing it down, the conjugate acid of water. So the conjugate acid of water is H3O plus. The original question was, using Bronsted-Lowry definition, how does an acid make H plus? Well, one, it doesn't actually make H plus. It makes hydronium. And it's the hydronium that gets made in a solution that makes the solution acidic. Okay, so all acids will do this. You throw any acid into water, it will donate an H onto water molecules and make hydronium. They have different abilities to do that, and so they have different strengths, and we'll learn about that later on but they all make hydronium. If you have an acidic solution, you have hydronium floating around in there. Most of it is going to be water, but some of it is going to be hydronium floating around, and it's that ion, not the H+, that makes the solution actually acidic. So all those things that acids do, well, it's because of that, okay? What about the bases? So I'm going to start with it because I had sodium hydroxide before. I'm going to start with sodium hydroxide because I want to start with that one. And then I'll go to explaining something like um, the ammonia that I used and the carbonate that I used earlier as being bases as well. So let's start with the sodium hydroxide. So if I take sodium hydroxide, and maybe some of you have seen sodium hydroxide, you've maybe used it in a lab if your teacher pulls out a bottle of sodium hydroxide, it comes in these little solid pellet form. So you take a scoop of sodium hydroxide pellets, throw them into water. Well, if you can throw solid sodium hydroxide pellets, because it's an ionic compound, you can throw them into water and they're solid. Well, then you're taking solid and you're putting it into water and it dissociates into sodium ions and hydroxide ions. Now, I don't need to go any further because it made hydroxide ions just by dissociating. So actually, the Arrhenius definition of sodium hydroxide as a base is perfect because it dissociated to produce hydroxide. However, let's kind of expand it into a Bronsted-Lowry world. So, like if the Arrhenius definition, we're going to kind of set that off to the side and say that it's not quite the way it's supposed to be. So how does, hyd how does hydroxide act as a Bronsted-Lowry base? So let's take this thing and let's continue it further. So let's kind of take it down here and say, okay, hydroxide floating around in water. So meaning it's floating around in water bumping into water molecules. So if it bumps into water molecules, what does it do? So here's kind of the, the diagram slightly different from the one that I showed you earlier. So here's the here's a hydroxide. 
oxygen attached to a hydrogen, covalently bonded because they're both nonmetals. Now that has, because the, I mean, if you think about it, this is kind of like a, a water molecule, right? Like a, another H stuck on there that you removed it. So you took away a positive and you left behind the electron, which means it's negatively charged. So an, a hydroxide is actually a, like a hydrogen removed from a water molecule and it's negatively charged. Here is a water molecule coming along again with its partially positives and partially negative parts. And imagine the two of them bump into each other. Well, the, obviously the negative part of this hydroxide loves that partially positive hydrogen that's right there. So when they bump into each other, the hydroxide ion steals the H off of the water molecule. Like this guy, let me get rid of this thing for a sec. This guy gets torn off and put over there on the hydroxide ion because it's a negative charge and kind of likes the hydrogen so it, it bumps into it, it steals it, essentially. Well, what does this thing become when you stick an H on it? Well, doesn't it become what I drew before? Like it, doesn't it just go back to having the H? I drew it with the dotted line before, but isn't that what happened? And then this thing loses its H and because it lost its H, it's now negatively charged. So they just switch positions. So the hydroxide bumps into a water, steals an H off of the water molecule, hydroxide becomes water, and the water becomes hydroxide. So you kind of go back to exactly what you had before. So this hydroxide here steals an H off of here. So this guy becomes, okay, imagine what this guy becomes. Now you've got two H's. I'm going to draw it like this, kind of weird. Okay, so it, there's the hydroxide. You stuck another H onto it. Now, no one writes water like this, but that's H2O. This guy, if you take an H off of it, now you're down to one H. Well, nobody ever writes that. You could, I don't know. You'd probably get in trouble for it if you did that in class. But they would write that. And so the reactants and the products are the same thing. So when I took sodium hydroxide and dissociated it into water, dissolved it into water and it dissociated, it produced hydroxide. Well, the hydroxide, if it happens to bump into a water molecule, just it's a one for one exchange, produces another hydroxide. So it doesn't even matter. It's almost like this reaction happens but it doesn't matter. And so oftentimes you'll just say to yourself, and certainly mathematically later on when we get into it mathematically, the hydroxide that gets made from something like sodium hydroxide dissolving in water, it's made directly. And so if we calculate using our moles and our volume of solution and all that kind of stuff, we'll be able to tell how much hydroxide actually gets made just from the dissociation. So that's sodium hydroxide. That's the Arrhenius bases that make hydroxide. Well, they just react with water to one for one exchange to make another hydroxide. But what about something like ammonia? Okay, and so this is where it gets quite a bit more complicated and kind of understanding the, the, how this all works is important. So if I take ammonia, which is NH3, not ammonium, ammonia, so the neutral compound, Ammonia is a gas, like if I had some ammonia floating around in here, it'd be a gas floating around in the air. But you can take ammonia and you can bubble it through water, or, um, do whatever you want to do to it under pressure, and it starts to dissolve. And so you can make a solution of ammonia. So when you do that, because it's covalent, the very first thing it does is it forms a molecular solution. So you write AQ it bumps into water molecules. Hang on, I need to put this, I need to put it further left, I'm gonna start again. 
Now, I'm using a single arrow. That may change later on as we get knowing more about the strengths of these things and stuff like that. It's The arrows are going to signify something. So um, suspend what the arrow means just for a little minute. So the ammonia plus water, they bump into each other. They collide. And H3, as you probably know, is the, the active ingredient in in Windex or glass cleaner and those glass cleaners are basic and that's what makes them good glass cleaners. So how does this thing produce hydroxide? For it to be a base, okay, so let's label it. If this thing is the base, based on a Bronsted Lowry definition, if that thing is a base, what must the water be? It's the only other thing bumping into it. So if NH3 is the base, the water must act as an acid, which is kind of weird because in the last thing we just did about HCl throwing into water, the water acted as a base. In this case, this guy is acting as an acid. So this concept of being able to accept or donate an H we'll get into later. That's kind of a critical thing and, and water is a really critical component of all of this. Needless to say, the NH3 is the base, therefore the water must be the acid. So therefore, the base must pick up an H and the water must donate the H. Well, does water have an H to donate? Of course it does. It's got two of them, as a matter of fact. So one of these H's can go over to the NH3. Now how do you know the NH3 is even capable of accepting an H? There's a couple of things that you have to know about um, different chemicals out there in the world. If you have a negative charge, so any anion can potentially have a place for an H+, right? If you're negatively charged, you attract an H+, and there's a place for it to sit because there's an extra electron. So the H+, can sit on it. It doesn't mean everything that's negatively charged will end up acting as a base. I said could be a base, and we'll learn later on whether they can or can't. So negative charges, we're looking for those. Or if you have a, an, a compound, a, a neutral compound that has um, a central atom with a, a lone pair of electrons. So in this case, nitrogen. Nitrogen has a lone pair of electrons. If you have NH3, and again, I'm going to draw the NH3. So if you have NH3, and there's an H, there's an H, there's an H. Each of those lines, Lewis dot diagrams, each of those lines is a bonding pair of electrons. But if you look at my diagram right there, okay, so the hydrogens are satisfied because they've got two and that's kind of what they always formed in covalent bonds. But the nitrogen only has two, four, six. That doesn't make a stable octet. So if you think back to Lewis diagrams in Chem 11, or even Science 10, I guess, that's not, a, that's not the proper Lewis diagram of NH3. So the proper diagram of NH3 would have two more electrons around that central atom right there. And that makes the stable octet. So nitrogen typically has five valence electrons. Each of the open electrons gets bonded with a hydrogen electron, so that's why NH3 is a stable compound. But because it's a stable compound, that octet that is formed, there's a lone pair of electrons. That lone pair of electrons is a docking space for a hydrogen. Think of any H+, plus, which is carrying along no electrons. It can bond anywhere where there are two electrons. So this spot right here is actually perfect for holding a hydrogen. Well, if here comes a water, that's partially positive, partially negative part right there, that hydrogen right there can easily jump over to that lone pair of electrons. And if it gets transferred over there, what do you end up making? Okay, so that nitrogen right there, here's the nitrogen. There's the original three, it kind of looks weird. Sorry, I don't like weird. So that nitrogen right there, there's the original ammonia. And then if we stick this hydrogen onto that lone pair of electrons, well, there's the pair of electrons, and there's the hydrogen. 
So what's the formula of that thing? Well, that's N H, because there's H's. How many of them? Well, there's four of them. There are four hydrogens. But this thing over here was neutral, and now you've added a proton to it. So this whole mess over here has to be, like that whole mess right there, has to have an overall charge of positive one, because you put a positive one thing on it. So this becomes plus one. It's an ion. It will float around in the water, so it's aqueous. Well, what does the water become? If this H gets sucked off of here, look what gets left behind. Well, the OH and its electron. So it becomes OH minus. Also an ion, negative, floats around in the water. So it gets produced. So there was no sign of hydroxide before you put the NH3 into the water. You put it into the water, NH3s bump into the water molecules, they start ripping off H's off of water molecules. And when you rip an H off of a water molecule, you produce hydroxide. Which means the hydroxide didn't come from the dissociation of anything. It came from the chemical reaction between NH3, which is the base, and water molecules acting as the acid, acting as the source of the H, you end up producing this. This guy right here is ammonia's, ammonia is the base. This guy right here, because it has one H more, is the conjugate, okay, and look at it in the reverse direction, the conjugate acid. So if you have ammonia as a base, picks up an H, it forms its conjugate acid. That conjugate acid has the name ammonium. And so you've probably heard of ammonium. You've probably done formulas with it, NH4, it's polyatomic cation, right? So you've probably made ammonium chloride, or you've dissolved it in water, or you've had to write that formula on your Science 10 quiz. Ammonium is NH4 plus 1. It is the conjugate acid of ammonia, its partner, I guess which is the base. Hydroxide, therefore, would be the conjugate base. So if you go in the reverse direction, ammonium could donate an H back to hydroxide, and you'd go back to these things over here. Carbonate, which is a negative ion. So carbonate, again, hopefully this is starting to to make a little sense. So a bronsted lowry base doesn't have to dissociate to make hydroxide. It needs to chemically react with the water to create or produce hydroxide. So it comes almost kind of out of nowhere, kind of magical. So CO3 carbonate Okay, so there's carbonate. If it's an ion, it it's, has to be dissolved in water or attached to a cation. I think I was talking about Tums earlier, so first thing Tums does is it dissociates into calcium ions and carbonate ions. The carbonate ions act as the base. So this thing in water, again, think Bronsted-Lowry. So the CO3, negative 2, is going to be the base. It picks up an H, a single H, and always be thinking single proton transfers here. So one H goes on to this thing. What does it form? Okay, well, you write the formula. Well, typically the formula is when you're putting H's on, you put them on the left-hand side of the formula, right? So CO3, put an H on top of it, and you get HCO3. What charges it now? So it was negative 2. You put a positive 1, I mean, think simple, simple number line. So you're at negative 2 on the number line, and you go plus 1. You're now at negative 1. So that is a charge of negative 1. Still an ion, therefore must be aqueous, <clears throat> floating around in the water. This, high, this water donated the H, so it is formed hydroxide. 
make two negative ions right here. But that's okay, look at the charge again. Over here, negative two and neutral, that's a combined net charge of negative two. Negative one, negative one, combined net charge of negative two. So the, the charge is conserved. What have we made? Well, when you take this thing, throw it into water, you make HCO3. Okay, so you make bicarbonate and you make hydroxide. And again, there's our hydroxide. That's why you make us a uh, basic solution because you're producing hydroxide. And so bases will always produce hydroxide because they're, they're ripping, a bases rip H's off of water molecules, thus producing hydroxide. And that's how it works. So how good they do that determines how strong that base is, how well it does it produces the hydroxide, right? So kind of depends on two things. One, how much base did you throw in there? And two, how well does it rip H's off of water molecules? So that's kind of the first three things that are there. The fourth thing, just real quick, is why is distilled water neutral? And this one's kind of an interesting thing. So if you take water, okay, so imagine just a beaker full of water. There's like gazillion water molecules floating around in there. Like think of one mole of water. So one mole of water weighs 18 grams. 18 grams of water is not very much. So if you take um, a beaker full of water, you might have, I don't know, say uh, 50 moles of water molecules. Well, that's a lot of water molecules. 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd is a mole. So you're talking about a lot of water molecules floating around in there. So they're bumping into each other. They're in liquid form. They're moving around. They're bumping into each other. Some of them have enough energy that when they bump into each other, and this is kind of cool, there's one water molecule in a liquid form. Bumps into another water molecule in liquid form, and they just bump just, I don't know, a certain, um, certain angle with a certain amount of energy, just kind of, I don't know, the... The time is right, the, the mood is right for two water molecules getting together. And one of them says, hey, I'm going to donate an H to you. And the other one says, okay, sure, in this situation, why not? So the thing is, they're all water molecules. So the direction at which the H goes from one to the other is kind of happenstance. It's, it's not entirely random. It has to do with, you know, the state of the molecules and all that. I mean, there's obviously some deeper physics going on here. But when two water molecules bump into each other, one can potentially donate to the other one. So let's say this guy is the donator. What is, what did we label it as? Well, we would label it as the acid. If you're the donator of an H, you would be labeled it as an, as an acid, right? Water is not acidic per se, but an individual water molecule might act as an acid if it donates an H. If it bumped into this guy and this guy accepted an H, that could be the base. Again, water is not basic, but an individual water molecule can accept an H and therefore in that situation be a base or act as a base. When those two things bump into each other, they make, okay, so this is an acid gets rid of an H and throws it over there. What's left behind on this thing? Well, you don't have two H's, you have one H. That makes hydroxide. This guy becomes that guy. That's its conjugate. This guy, if it acts as a, as a base, it accepts an H plus. Okay, you had two H's, you pick up an H, you're now on to three H's. What do you make? You make that hydronium thing. Hydroxide is what makes the solution basic. Hydronium is what makes the solution acidic. But when this collision occurs, when one water molecule bumps into another water molecule, then you produce one hydroxide and one hydronium. If 40 trillion of these bump into 40 trillion of those, well, you got 40 trillion of those and 40 trillion of those. It's just basic stoichiometry. That's, well, okay, that makes complete sense. Five of those, five of those, you make five of those, five of those. They're always the same. If you have pure water and all it is water bumping into water, you always get equal amounts of hydroxide and hydronium. Hydroxide is what makes a solution basic. Hydronium is what makes a solution acidic. They're always equal if you've got pure water with nothing else in there. 
when they're equal, that's what a neutral solution is. Neutral doesn't mean it doesn't have any acid and base. It means it's got equal amounts of the acid and the base. It's got equal hydroxide and it's got equal hydronium. So neutral means hydronium concentration equals hydroxide concentration. That's what neutral means. Neutral does not mean 7. Don't ever think that neutral means pH of 7. That gets thrown for a big loop later on because if you have water that's not at 25 degrees, neutral is not 7. So that's like you need to get that out of your head. Neutral is defined by hydronium equals hydroxide. That's what it means. So therefore, if you're talking about acidic and basic solutions, keeping it very simple, the word acidic means, like, how would I finish that? If I use something that's very similar to this, you probably already got it in your head. If you're talking acidic solutions, somehow the hydronium gets bigger than the hydroxide. Well, acids produce hydronium. You've, I showed you earlier that you throw an acid into water, it chemically reacts, donates an H to the water, it makes hydronium. And so naturally the hydronium in the water you made goes up. And that's what defines an acidic solution. Not below pH of 7. Hydronium is greater than hydroxide concentration. So, I mean, obviously the basic, which for those of you who know the terminology, Alkaline, so you'll hear people talking about alkaline solutions. So a basic solution means that the hydronium is less than the hydroxide. And like, keep those very basic, very general definitions in your head. They're not numerical um, definitions. Don't ever use a number when you're defining neutral, unless you're being very specific about the temperature. These are the definitions. So if someone ever says to you, well, define neutral solution, say hydronium concentration equals hydroxide. Okay, so that's for now. You can see that our next class is going to be about water's equilibrium, uh, very Chem 12 specific. If you didn't know about equilibrium, you would really struggle with what water's equilibrium is all about. So we'll talk about that, and it's very critical to understanding pH. Uh, and POH, as you're going to learn later on. So bring your equilibrium skills. Also bring a calculator if you're watching this uh, so that you can do the calculations while I'm doing it. You need to know about logarithms, so your math 12 and logs is going to come up. So hope this was helpful. I'll see you next time.